Currently, I'm the program manager for uh, Safe Place of Eastern South Dakota, and we're located in Mitchell, South Dakota. And like I said, we cover an eight county um, radius is, is what we cover, eight counties total. So one thing that we um, get to do then is present these through our OBW grant. We got a grant through the Office of Violence Against Women. And with this grant, then we can do our prevention and education um, as what we're doing with this five-part webinar series. So today we're gonna go over domestic violence, um, really define what it is, understand what the relationship abuse is, talk about that power and control wheel and touch a little bit on equality, talk about barriers of why someone leaves a violent relationship and then what you guys can do, like we talked about, where are your resources in your area and then how to get them um, to refer them to um, our services. So domestic violence is also referred to as intimate partner violence. Uh, that definition will cover then the dating abuse or relationship abuse. Um, and it is a pattern. It's a pattern of power and control over someone else. If you don't take anything away from this presentation, this is the one thing I do want you to take away from this, is to have that understanding that it's that power and control that someone exerts on another person. That's where domestic violence um, definition is. So this domestic violence also includes uh, physical and sexual violence, and we'll cover that on through that power and control wheel. Threats and intimidation, there can also be stalking, emotional and physical abuse, and then that financial abuse that happens too. So like I said, going out into our communities and talking to uh, the community, domestic violence occurs across all populations, regardless of our gender, identity, class, and we know people, it either, like I said, you've experienced it yourself or you know of someone who's experienced that. Um, it can be, uh, like I said, it can affect, um, when we talk about effect, it can affect your family, it can affect your work, and we'll get into those later. No one is immune. So... For our agency, we do, we participate every year in a South Dakota um, national DV counts, domestic violence counts. And what we do is present all of our data to the national database and what they, they come back with um, statistics. And in South Dakota, 51% of people, men and women experience some form of domestic violence. So that's saying, over half of us in South Dakota have experienced ourselves domestic violence. So power and control. One of the, the power and control wheel in this video that he'll talk about is used by us as advocates to really help educate and help victims understand where they fall in in this power and control and really do that educational piece on okay, if you're experiencing this, what can we do? Kind of give you that safety plan of getting to the next steps. So I wanna to talk to you about the power and control wheel. It is a wheel that was developed in Duluth, Minnesota in the early 1980s. And it was advocates talking to women who were battered, many, many conversations about what it's like to live with a man who beats them into submission. What are all the ways in which he, he gets this done? And when you look at the wheel, on the outside, you see this physical and sexual violence. And then on the inside, you see these eight different tactics and, and ways in which they achieve this dominance over their partner. A lot of those tactics inside that wheel are things that might happen in other relationships that aren't that, like emotional abuse. What changes in these relationships is when physical violence or the threat of it has been used in the relationship, it changes how those tactics play out. So for example, if a man comes home in a nonviolent relationship and announces to his, to his uh, wife that he's not going to um, do any domestic chores anymore, that would probably cause some sort of a sit down conversation between the two of them. However, in a relationship where there's battering, 
if he comes home and announces that he's not going to do any domestic chores from this point forward, then she's got a lot to think about and how she wants to respond to that because he's proven that he will use physical violence to get her to submit. And so um, the way in which those tactics play out changes when there's physical and sexual violence in the relationship. Okay. And then if you see that power and control in the middle, that's what he ends up with when he uses the violence and all these different tactics to, to dominate her. He ends up with power and control. Now, most men won't say, I want power and control over her. That, that won't, wouldn't be their language. What they often end up saying is that I want her to shut the hell up. I want her to stay home. I want her to get the kids in bed. I want her to discipline the kids in the correct way. That's what he's trying to get. He, he has this way of trying to get her to constantly do or execute the world as he sees it. And um, the tactics are how he achieves that. So what we're going to do now is go through each one of those tactics to get a better understanding. Because once you get an understanding of the tactics that the perpetrator or the partner um, will use, you'll have an understanding then of the decisions on why it's hard for someone to leave the situation. Um, and we'll get to that later. But the first one we'll talk about is intimidation. Intimidation is that you frighten them by a certain way that you're looking, your actions, um, gestures that you make, tone of voice. They're really those, those nonverbals that someone is giving you that you know when you get home that something is going to happen. Uh, when we talk about um, destroying property, it could be smashing things and destroying property of the other person's. So when you're in a relationship and they're destroying something that's meaningful to you or smashing things in front of you to do that intimidation factor. So if you're going to break that in front of me, then I know maybe the next time that's going to be myself that you're going to do that to. When we talk about um, abusing pets, one of the statistics are um, if there's pet abuse going on in the home, more likely domestic violence is happening. So for this is a really good educational piece for uh, veterinarians, um, animal shelters, they would have th this information to know that there might be something going on that they could give information to uh, that person bringing someone in or a pet in to maybe they can get help um, to get out of the situation. Another one would be displaying weapons. This would be anything like if you were in the kitchen, you grab a knife, uh, guns, anything to display a weapon to have that intimidation. The next one we talk about is that emotional abuse. Uh, a lot of the times it's going to be that name calling, private or in public. Um, one of the things that we hear is um, after a while, when you keep hearing uh, the emotional abuse happening, you yourself are going to think that that's happening, that, that you think of that as yourself. If you continue to tell someone that they're crazy, they're not doing it right, then they'll put them on, they'll put that on themselves to feel like I'm not doing a good job. Something's wrong with me. Um, using put downs to make the partner feel bad, really that, that guilting. A lot of times with the emotional abuse, we'll talk about that gaslighting, um, making that other person feel guilty. With this one, too, when we talk about domestic violence, and a lot of times people think about that physical abuse that's going on, but really the emotional abuse is, is the hardest one and the most impactful uh, tactic that someone can use on another person. When it comes to isolation, that's more of controlling what the victim does, who they talk to, where they go. This is going to be something that I, when I go out into the communities and really talk about, um, saying, you know, how to get out. They don't want them to leave that community. They don't want them to reach out to anyone else. 
when someone comes in with uh, a lot of the isolation, they don't have a support system because they weren't allowed to be able to talk to maybe their family or do activities that they like. A lot of jealousy. Um, it's only me. Why don't you spend time with me? We'll hear a lot of that when it comes to isolation. Uh, minimizing, denying, and blaming, making light of the abuse, and doesn't take victims' concerns seriously, denies that it ever occurred. You'll see a lot of like this part to a lot of the gaslighting happening in this section, shifts that responsibility of the abuse to the victim. Uh, we here do a program, it's a batters program, it's the Domestic Abuse Intervention Project, and they go through the power and control wheel and they talk about the tactics that they use on their partner. One of those things that we ask is kind of what led up to the reason that you're coming to this class. A lot of the times in that narrative or that description of why they're coming, that's where that they're placing the blame on the victim. It's she's the reason I'm here. If she wouldn't have gambled or if she wouldn't have uh, left me home with the kids, they have all of these different excuses that they're blaming the partner for the reason the abuse is happening. One of the things that we see here um, with our domestic violence shelter, we have um, also a visitation center. This is where we can really have that third party watch that supervised visit or that exchange to help with that ease of not putting the children in the middle. That way they can watch what's going on in that visit and help monitor. Uh, partners will use the children. They'll make them feel guilty. They'll try to relay those messages. When they're using visitation to harass, they'll say, I'll take the kids away and you won't be able to see them. Or they'll take them away and say that they will call and report them to social services. With kids, using the kids, a lot of times when we're talking to the perpetrator, when we're asking the questions, he doesn't feel or that person doesn't feel that the kids, it's affecting them because the abuse isn't happening when the children aren't, aren't around. But we know that it will affect them um, just because even them being in the household, then things that are happening when kids come into shelter we see that effect that it'll have on them, that either they'll take on the role of being abusive to another sibling, um, they'll be mean to their mother, or they will just really retreat to and be that, that caretaker of their mom and do some of those mothering and nurturing things, taking care of the other children or helping mom. The other one that we talk about male privilege or privilege. It doesn't necessarily have to be male or any type of privilege worried that you are acting like um, you're the king of the, of the household. You're treating your other partner as a slave. You're making all the decisions uh, without um, talking to your partner. And then you're defining and enforcing your role um, and saying, this is what I'm gonna do. And then this is your role. Those are when we talk about privilege. The other part of the wheel is the economic. This is where you're preventing someone from getting a job or keeping a job. One of the things that we can see in this is when they're going to work, you're either taking their paycheck from them or you'll take the paycheck and then just give them an allowance. Say you can only spend this amount of money or you can take completely take the money altogether and doesn't allow them to know access to family income. We've worked on cases too, where in this one, uh, there was a partner that ended up taking out various credit cards and using them without the partner knowing uh, once they separated and, and did a financial background check. Um, they found out then there was several cards taken out on their name and infected their credit score. Coercion and threats. This one here is more of um, threatening to harm themselves. A lot of times we'll hear the uh, partner say, especially when they're uh, enrolling in the classes, saying, 
if uh, she leaves me, then I'm going to hurt myself. A lot of times, too, when they get arrested, there's a no contact that uh, goes on and they will ask the victim to drop the charges. Now, with our laws and stuff, when someone goes out for a domestic violence call, the officers will do a lethality assessment or DV assessment. And with that, make a determination on who the uh, predominant aggressor is and they will uh, do the arrest of, of that person. So power and control, now that we went through them, this is kind of where I ask for participation in the chat. We'll kind of, as we go. So when we're talking about the power and control will tactics, which one would be more of that physical abuse or the threat of abuse to the victim, the children, or the pets? Which section of that power and control would that be? You can either put it in the chat or if you would want to unmute and answer. Can you repeat the question? Yep, right on here. It's either that physical abuse or threat of abuse to the victim, children, or pets. It'd be more that coercion and threat. That's where this section would be. And then there's there also could be some of that intimidation factor as well. So controlling finances or withholding money. Which one of the tactics would that one fall under? I see one with privilege. Another one would be the, the economic. Sabotaging a partner's job by making them miss work, constantly calling them at work, or showing up uninvited. And this affects this affects the their job and the money and the income. So that would be economic abuse. Verbal insults that humiliate a partner. A lot of that's the emotional. Threatening partner's sexual orientation. And that's where that, that privilege would come in. And emotional. Telling a partner who he or she can't hang out with. That would also include the social media. And that again, too, would be a lot of that isolation. Stealing or insisting or having a partner's internet or bank passwords. That would be more of your trying to intimidate, trying to get time, some of that economic, especially when it's talking about the bank passwords. Isolating a partner from family and friends, of course, that has the isolation. Illegally or improperly using elder funds or property or assets. We talk about when we talk about uh, at the beginning that power and control, not just in a uh, you know relationship, but it also can be a relationship where it talks about maybe a grandmother. Um, that we've seen that too. Um, using drugs, physical restraints to punish someone. So a lot of that, the physical. 
treating the elder like a child. That would be a lot like the privilege, making them think they're crazy. Um, isolation, elderly person from family or friends or regular activities. That's that isolation part. Refusing to fail or provide life necessities. That'll be some of that isolation as well. And refuse to transport to get to any medical appointments and withhold the financial. So there's a lot of tactics and a lot of different ways that fall into this power and control. So in the, the domestic abuse um, intervention project, our 27 week program, it's the Duluth model. We have broken down those each tactics into three different things that we're looking at in each one. We're talking about what's going on in their relationship we really look at different ways and how to learn how to have better relationships, and then they have to practice those. So this is really what we strive for when we're looking at um, the relationships. We really want to have that trust in each other, that shared responsibility, having honesty and accountability. She, our, our facilitator, who, uh, who does that, that's one of the number one things that the goal is of the program is to have that accountability for their actions and then being honest about what has happened in that relationship. If they can get to that point, then that means that program for them was very successful. If they can't get to that point, then they're, they're um, at, a, at a standstill where that power and control, that cycle will continue to happen. So now that we know the tactics and what um, power and control and domestic violence looks like, what are the barriers to leaving? As us as advocates, we get the question of understanding why someone stays or why doesn't she just leave? There's a lot of different reasons why someone doesn't leave. We talked about the different tactics that are going on. One of the things that happens is that hope. They're really hoping that they the relationship will change. Once, once they, they leave that relationship and that person gets counseling or gets enrolled into our program, there might be hope that it really will change. And sometimes when we see that cycle, that cycle could last for years. We could have a really good thing that's, that's going on, but then we can have that tension building that something's going to happen and then that abuse um, does occur. So that's that's the number one thing. And they, lo they, the, they love the other person. They really do. And that's why they have that hope that the abuse will end. Uh, threats of violence. Being controlled and hurt is, is traumatizing um, for, oops, traumatizing for them. They just, uh, the, the, so it's the threats. And we'll talk about that continuum. It's another handout you're going to get. But the threats that happen that it might just be pushing. They might be able to tolerate the pushing, but when the abuse continues to happen, the threat to get bigger and greater. And we see with some, sometimes they can tolerate the violence, but when that violence happens to their children or to a pet, that's when that's that breaking point for them. Um, another thing we talk about is lack of resources. They, they really just don't know what resources are out there for them. And in smaller communities, how true is that, that there's not a lot of resources that someone can uh, receive in the communities. And we really have to work together to have, uh, to have that understanding, that education, that there is resources out there for them. We just have to present them so that they have an, that they know that there is something for them to be able to break away. Sometimes we'll see in cases that we work with that there's uh, spiritual or cultural reasons that someone may stay, it might be a belief in their church that no matter what happens in that relationship, they need to stay together. And some of the cultures um, have different belief systems as well. Lack of family, um, friend support. If you, they've been isolated in that relationship, 
they have to, they aren't able to have that connection with them. It might've been years. Um, and sometimes too, this is where it's, it's really um, effective. And we'll talk about that in later slides. But if someone comes to you and says that, that there's something going on in the relationship and need that support, you want to be there for them indeed saying, if, if they call on you, no matter what, that you're going to be there for them. A lot of times uh, family and friends get frustrated that they continue to be in this relationship. And if we can be able to give that support to them, then we can be able to help them. Um, children, a lot of times they stay, they don't want to have that broken home. They want to be able to keep that family connected. And for some of them, they don't want to leave because that would take them away from their school or their friends. And so they really just have to, to do those priorities and know that they will be safe. Their children will be safer if they leave. And then fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what's going to happen if I actually leave, uh, fear of what resources, what, what things are out there for us, because they've told us that if they leave, uh, my income will be taken away. My children will be taken away. You won't have any resources. You don't have any family support. So they really have a fear of what's going to happen if I do leave. So we talk about that cycle and I, and I talked about in that other slide where they have that hope, um, because there is glimmers of hope. When you look at the, the cycle, if there is things that are going on, there's the hitting, there's using the weapons, there's those tactics. And what is happening then is the victim's trying to protect themselves. They'll call police. Sometimes they're calling law enforcement just to stop that abuse. They don't want that other person to go to jail or have those, those things happen. They just want the violence to stop. So a lot of times when officer calls, when they do the DV assessment and they ask to talk to an advocate, their first response may not be, I want to leave and come into shelter. Their response is, I just wanted to stop for the night. And then they'll have that, that honeymoon stage of, I'm sorry things are happening. I've gone to counseling. I'm going to church more often. Victim is starting to say, yep, I agree. I see some changes. Um, they feel very hopeful things are going to change. And then you get that tension again. Something's happening. They're starting to be very, you know, moody and nitpicky and starting to threatening. And then you have the victim saying, oh, I need to just, this is where they're walking on eggshells. I don't know. I got to just be careful. Um, something is going to happen. So we talked about domestic violence. It hurts everyone. Um, and without intervention, um, it, it will reoccur and it will intensify. When us as advocates were working with someone, we could see someone up to an average of seven times coming for services, not necessarily staying in shelter, but seeking some information, um, just some understanding why this continues to happen. Um, I need to get out. But what we're seeing is that every time they come back, it gets a little bit more intense as what is happening. Like I said, at the beginning, um, we talked about they're okay with maybe that pushing or that shoving but now they're starting to display a weapon. Now they're threatening me to say, if I leave, I'm going to hurt myself. And then we talked about the one thing that's the, uh, the worst type of abuse to uh, go through is the um, that emotional abuse. Because if we start hearing that name calling and making ourselves feel crazy, then that might be a time that we might take our own lives or uh, we might end up to the point where it's just too much and we need to get out. With domestic violence, the most dangerous time for a victim is when she's leaving that relationship. Victims are much higher risk of leaving that relationship than being or after breaking free. 75% of being killed. And that's why it's such a high risk for law enforcement going and being first responders on that scene. 
we have to we have to work together we have to be able to find those resources and get them out safely that's why here um, with our shelter it is uh, security we want to make sure that they're here they're here for their safety and safety alone we want to make sure that they will be okay so your role your role can make a difference it's how you react and how you can contribute to someone disclosing to you that they are in a, a relationship that is just making them feel uncomfortable. They don't feel right. They just need to be able to, to get out or just get some help. So what can we do? The first thing we can do is recognize. Recognize what's going on in that relationship. See some of those warning signs that are happening. They could be making, if you see something they may react of, they have excuses for their injuries. We um, here do also training with first responders. So when they're on the scene, what they may think is an injury that happened from falling down, we wanna let them know that that might be a defense wound that's happening. Give them an understanding of what goes on in the physical injuries. Their personality changes. Like I said, when they face that emotional abuse, they have a low self-esteem in someone who's always had, you know, that, that confidence. Uh, we can see, too, a kind of a shift, too, where they may have that low self-esteem, but they're now starting to act out um, more than they have in the past. Constantly checking in with their partner. If you have someone that you're hanging out with and they're constantly checking their phone or saying, I need to be home in a certain time, those are some red flags that might be happening. And remember, too, as we're going through this, this is that they're displaying that power and control over someone else. Never having money on hand. You know, just asking them, you know, I see that, you know, there's several times that you, you know, don't have any money on hand, what, you know, if they could tell you a little bit what's, what's going on. Overly worried about pleasing their partner, skipping work, school, social outings, never a clear reason on why they're not there, especially with coworkers, you know, it can always kind of document, not, not to a way of, of wanting to get them in trouble, but you're documenting on, you know, I've I'm concerned, you know, you, you weren't at this function or you always show up a little bit later to work this last month. What, what's been, you know, going on? Wearing clothes that don't fit the season, especially now in, in the summer months, you know, someone's wearing long sleeves when we're 80 or, you know, 90 degrees out to cover the, the bruises being emotionally or verbally abused, like taking away the their keys or their medications or just getting having those essentials and constantly being put down by their partner in public or even on social media. And then, like I said, one of the things that you can look out for is if that a partner is being abusive towards their pets. So how can we respond? How can we get help for someone that is experiencing domestic violence? We can educate ourselves so that this is so great that I had this opportunity to be able to share this information with you. Now you'll be able to, when you are working, you'll be able to say, hey, that doesn't seem right. Maybe I can help them. Start the conversation with them. Ask them those questions. Say, you know, it is, you know, you're, I see, I noticed you're wearing a long sleeve shirt today and it's really hot out. Is, you know, everything okay? Lend that sympathetic ear. Just being able to hear them out. Um, we don't want to give our opinions and, you know, push our, our agendas onto them, but we really want to listen to what's going on. Don't blame the victim. If someone's coming to you and reporting something, talk about what is actually happening. Don't blame them to say, I can't believe that you're still in that relationship. I don't understand why you keep going back. Yeah, we want you not to be doing those things. Empower their decisions, especially 
the one thing that uh, we do here at, with advocacy work is when someone finally makes that decision to come into shelter, we let them know that is the bravest thing that they could have done is come and break away from the abuse that is happening. We really want them to be able to, to feel that empowerment of they made that decision and uh, it, it's, a, it's a good one. We hope that they will be able to have that strength to move forward. And again, now focus on their strengths. You know, when, when they're here, we start to have those conversations of what are some things that you like? What are some things that you've done in the past? And once we can find some of their strengths, we really try to help them open them up, uh, especially um, with some of the cultures, they like to be able to do some of their work. Uh, some, some of them like beating or their art or even just writing poems. They're just, there's just some wonderful things that they possess that we try to help them focus on why they're here. Develop a safety plan. Um, when you're doing that with someone, try to assess that risk that will happen if they're going to leave. So be prepared, identify those resources and start strategizing on if they do come, this is how we're going to go about it. One of the things that we tell them if they're getting ready to leave is having some of that stuff already in place because when a crisis situation happens, they've got to go. So they're not thinking clearly on all of the stuff that they need to do. Uh, important paperwork, documentation. So when they come in, we uh, some of them may not have a uh, driver's license or their birth certificate. Having those things will help them with their next steps. So having an extra copy somewhere, having an extra set of keys, stashing money away, even just having extra clothing um, somewhere or a, a duffel bag that's already packed in a safe place. And it's always good to have, have someone else know about your plan. So when someone else is ready to leave, then you can say, okay, yes, we talked about A, B, and C. Now we can be able to get you out safely. And be a friend indeed. Like I talked earlier, if someone discloses to you and you let them know that you're going to be there for them, then be there for them when someone does reach out to you. And refer. It is hard. It is, it's definitely a high risk situation. Uh, that's why we get this information out to you. We, we don't want you to be able to give advice on what, uh, so we just, for putting yourself, we don't want to put yourselves in danger. We have resources and, and people that are trained in this area to be able to give that um, appropriate advocacy to them. So we talked about empowering the victims and providing resources. So what can you ask and what can you do? We can ask, is everything okay? I, I see that, you know, like we talked about earlier, you've been coming to work late um, this month. Is something happening? Let them know that you're concerned about them and you really want to help and be able to support them. And how can you help them protect their safety? And what to do. The first thing that we want um, to see is that when someone comes to you, we want you to believe them. Um, April was Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and one of the campaigns that we did here, we partnered with both of the MTC, the college here, and the university, and we had people take a pledge. Take a pledge that says that I'm going to start believing someone if they disclose to me that they've been a victim or even a survivor that's coming and saying that they need to be able to get out. Respect their decision. And you want them to have that confidence in you that if they're gonna come to you, that you'll be able to help them with the next steps. Encourage them to seek the help. This one always gets tricky because you, know, you want them to get out. You want them to be able to do what you say um, and is, is gonna happen, but Sometimes we can give them all the resources in the world and they may decide that they don't want to leave, that they do want to go back, but really strongly encourage them to come seek that help. And this is where you can be a friend and say, 
let me go with you. I know where the local domestic violence shelter is, or I know that the real advocate's going to be in my community this day. Let's go to the library to meet with them or remind them that they're not alone. That's the biggest thing, that they're not alone in this, that there are people out there that can help them. We do have resources here. Uh, the resources that we have is uh, the Safe Place of Easter, South Dakota, and we want to create that safe and empowering environment for someone who is experiencing domestic violence, sexual assault, and even human trafficking to come to seek that help. I'm just going to go over a little bit about uh, the resources we offer. I did this in the first slide, but it's always nice to get that refresher of what we do here. So with Safe Place and our services, we offer um, emergency shelter. We also have advocacy services. Those can be helping someone's safety plan. We also help with uh, getting protection orders. We also help with someone who's been sexually assaulted. We go and be with them at the hospital or making a report to law enforcement. And we're fortunate here, we have a family visitation center and that's our third party exchange center where the kiddos can see their moms and dads. We also work closely with Department of Social Services. So if there's any kiddos that have any abuse and neglect cases, they can come and visit them here at the visitation center. One of the things that we have here at Safe Place is we get a grant, it's a justice grant, and that is for specifically for families that are experiencing violence, domestic violence. They, we have an extra precaution as we're doing the visits. We actually have a monitor specialist that's in the room with the visiting parent and the child. And then we have another one who actually monitors the visit. It's just that extra protection that we can offer um, those that are experiencing domestic violence. We have a financial and housing assistance program. We, it's called the Emergency Solutions Grant. We get that out of the South Dakota Housing Program. And that way we can help with assistance with utilities, first month's rent. We can also help with uh, arrears that have happened because of the abuse. And then we have um, support group and classes. So I talked about, we have the Domestic Abuse Intervention Project which is the 27 Week Batters program. We have a women's support group. And then we also have parenting classes. We have two different sets of parenting classes here. We have a responsive parenting class that comes out of Sanford. And then we also have the common sense parenting, which is like the school-aged um, program that comes out of uh, Boys Town out of Omaha. And then we have our outreach and community education, which what we're doing today is we're being able to spread that information, not just about our services that we have here, but about the programs and about the victimizations that we work with, domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. We couldn't do this without the collaboration and the work of all of our multidisciplinary teams that we have. We have the Davidson County Child Protection Team, and they're composed of our counselors, our teachers, um, we have the nurses that come together and talk about kiddos that are being abused and neglect and how can we um, better serve them through our agencies. We have our Mitchell Area Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Response Team, and we come together and talk about domestic violence and sexual assault cases what has been happening in those cases and how can we better respond and educate um, the communities and others about these issues. And then we have Call to Freedom. Call to Freedom, we partnered with them a few years ago. One of the things that we've seen is that there's sometimes can be a correlation or um, they can identify with one or more victimizations. When someone was coming in, we thought a lot of times they would be domestic violence, but as we got educated and understood that someone is being trafficked. Um, last year and the year before, we usually average about seven, six or seven cases of human trafficking through our shelter. 
And that's why it's so important that we've partnered with the East River Human Trafficking Task Force to spread that information, to let people know that if they see someone that's being trafficked, that they can refer them to our agency and that we would be able to partner with our uh, with Call to Freedom to be able to get them a case manager. So we talk about where can you refer them to? This is a map of all of the places that you could refer someone to. The red is all of the different um, agencies that have some type of victim service program that's either all domestic or domestic and sexual assault. And then we also have seven visitation centers in South Dakota as well. We are under the Department of Public Safety, so you can go on there and look to see which shelter is the closest to your area. They have a map just like this, and then you can be able to click on there to see and get that information. We're also a part of the South Dakota Network, and they're more of providing that educational piece like I am today about the information about domestic violence and sexual assault. And I have both of their websites on here for you. So the one thing that I want you guys to know is that you can't stop domestic violence, but the reason we did this today is that you can support and start the healing process for the survivors that are seeking the services. And I left my uh, contact information here for our shelter. So you can take those down. And then I'll leave it up to you guys for any questions that you have.